Thanks for coming, everyone, and thanks so much for having me, uh, Micah and everybody. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about monsters and cyborgs and kind of different cultural illusions we have for thinking about the body. Um, and this text pulls from Rosie Bredotti's ideas about teratology, which is a new concept for me. So um, I'll also talk about Donna Haraway and cyborgs a little bit. As a child, you pay little attention to your body until it, until it starts to change. Slowly at first, and then with bursts of blood and hormones, coupled with paralyzing confusion and self-consciousness. These changes, the stuff that elevates puberty into cultural narrative, feel both as impossible and impending as the change of seasons. And then, without permission, our bodies break, age, or deform, losing sync with our minds, if they were ever connected to begin with. There's something ineffable about the body, its processes, decisions, and otherness. As much as we feel at home in our own skin, or otherwise jailed in a familiar cell, we develop thoughts and prejudices against our bodies as they become, they become unwittingly coded with societal ciphers. Sometimes we're surprised by what they do, developing cancer, breeding disease. Those of us with monstrous bodies, uncooperative bodies, or bodies made of cells run amok, have become, to our, have become accustomed to our social othering. The preconceived notions heaped upon us, based on our appearance as signified by sex, class, racial markers, no matter how our outward appearance might seem mismatched with our subjectivity. It goes without saying that the Caucasian male is the neutral idea, ideal, while the female is rooted in otherness and peculiarity. Simone de Beauvoir writes in The Second Sex that men represent po both positivity and negativity so much that its very word, home, also means human beings, while woman represents negativity and any determination is imputed to her as a limitation without reciprocity. Our collective readings of the body are reinforced from a young age, silently passed down through generations. The archetypes relating to sexual difference evolve at a snail's pace, and it has taken us the better part of centuries to locate and dismantle them as social myths rather than scientific facts. De Beauvoir writes that the essentialisms attached to womanhood, Judaism, and blackness have faded since the time of St. Thomas Aquinas, when it was, quote, an essence defined with as much certainty as the sedative quality of a poppy. Instead, today we consider gender, gender to be situational, a performance detached from a person's biological sex. De Beauvoir writes, if there is no such thing today as femininity, it is because there never was. Though gender-based essentialisms have lost footing in science, related cliches have maintained a stronghold in Western culture, repairing ad nauseum in literature, music, and cinema to the point of becoming instructive. Cinema, with its ability to reproduce embodied behaviors, is particularly suited to routinely confer and perpetuate notions of sexual difference and gender-coded behavior. In her essay, Visual Culture and Narrative Cinema, Laura Mulvey writes of the psychological experience of watching mainstream fil film and its soothing effect of recalling familiar archetypes. She states that the voyeuristic distance of the body from the screen begets a psychological separation between the ego and the screen subject, which cultivates the ego's ideal version of the world in a private harmony 
in your own living room or in a theater. In an industry where the overwhelming majority of films are directed by Caucasian men, this ideal worldview must most often, most often perpetuates the centrality of white male experience and casts women and people of color as auxiliary characters or sexual objects. Should one need any proof that, that the centrality of the white male is a crisis in mainstream filmmaking, look no further than the Oscars. Not one actor of color was nominated by the Academy in 2015 or 2016. Further, nearly half of all movies made in 2014 didn't pass the Bechdel test, which requires simply that a film have at least two women in which they are named and who talk to each other about something other than a man. As women have been historically excluded from self-representation in all forms of culture, writing realistic portrayals of feminine or differently gendered non-male experience is a political act. In Laugh of the Medusa in 1976, Pauline Sissou writes that woman must write herself. She must write about women and bring women into writing from which they have been driven away as violently as from their bodies and for the same reasons, by the same law, with the same fatal goal. Woman must put herself into the text as into the world and into history by her own movement. The imperative to write woman into existence by literature, song, or art has since become a feminist mandate. The artists that I'll discuss, Valley Export, Lynn Hirschman Leeson, Hito Steyrl, and Andrea Crespo, all consider the public display of embodied differences as a political act. In 1969, the Austrian artist Valley Export walked into a Munich art house cinema wearing pants with the crotch cut out, revealing her hairy vagina. A mostly male group of experimental filmmakers were showing their work, and as the audience was seated, they were confronted with the reality of Export's vagina as she walked around the room. Titled Action Pants, Genital Panic, this performance juxtaposed an actual vagina as a symbol of womanhood with the cinema as a public space that confers and perpetuates the idealization of the female body through the imagination of men. Similarly, in Tap and Touch Cinema in 1968, a topless Valley Export wore a cardboard box in Munich's Stachus Public Square where she invited the public to touch her breasts. Like Export's revealing of her vagina in action pants, the tactile experience of the female body was meant to act as an antidote to the male voyeur voyeuristic fantasy in cinema. In Export's body configurations, um, which ran from 1972 to 1976, Export inserted herself into the skeleton of the city rather than cinema, laying on the ground, coiling her body around Munich's public architecture. In the photograph Abrundung, or Running Off, in 1976, Export lays on the side, arms outstretched, and curls herself around a curb. Drawn on the photograph are lines emanated, emanating from a nearby lamppost connecting the points on her fingertips to toes, suggesting a dissolving of figure in architecture. Using her own body to flatten public and cinematic space, Export suggests that these are sites in which female self-identification is a charged, perhaps impossible act. In the repressive climate of post-war Munich and Vienna, Export's feminist works examine the agency of women in the public sphere, as well as the role of the largely misogynist cultural imaginary in private and public life. 
Exports works expand on cinema's relationship to male fantasy, voyeurism, and the popular representation of women, and point to the reality of the body to deflate these projections. This was an important task for second wave feminism, and one that set up the subsequent query. What if I don't identify as female at all? How can I emancipate myself from the so-called natural origins and limitations of my body? From 1960s onward, the cyborg has become a central cultural allegory through which we understand the body in a society increasingly marked by advancements in info and biotechnology. The term cyborg was coined in 1960 by two scientists, Manfred Klein and uh, Nathan S. Klein, as space exploration was becoming a reality. They proposed the term to describe the, quote, exogenously extended organizational complex functioning as an integrated homeostatic system unconsciously. Later, in 1983, Donna Haraway published Cyborg Manifesto, in which she writes, our best machines are made of sunshine. They are all light and clean because they are nothing but signals, electromagnetic waves, a section of a spectrum, and these machines are eminently portable, mobile, a matter of immense human pain in Detroit and Singapore. People are nowhere near so fluid, being both material and opaque. Cyborgs are ether, quintessence. In Haraway's conceptualization, the body is not immaterial or dematerialized, but actually fully materialized in the form of lines and fiber optics. New media art pioneer Lynn Hirschman Leeson was already thinking about cyborgs in the burgeoning biotechnology industry in the mid 1960s, a few years after the term was coined. In the early part of the decade, Hirschman was experiencing breathing difficulties due to a heart ail ailment, and she looked to the cyborg as an evolutionary <coughs> potentiality. She was living in Los Angeles, where smog was an ever-present issue, and she focused on breathing because that's all I could do. Quote. In 1963, Hirschman was photocopying an image of a woman when, a paper when the paper caught and the Xerox's machine's internal mechanisms, and the woman's image spat out as, quote, a crumpled smear of technology. This prompted her series of cyborg drawings that envision women as invincible creatures cobbled together from flesh and technological bits. Smog Protector, 1970, combines a drawing of a woman in a bathing suit and cap with diagrams relating to various cyborgian air filtration systems. She bears a heat-resistant adhesive shield and filters air via pores. In Butterfly Woman Sleeping in 1967, a wax face donning a wig and eyeglass is encased in a motion-sensitive vitrine which emanates breathing sounds of his viewers pass by. Glitter, butterflies, and feathers adorn the mummified face as if in a funeral rite for a barely alive organism. The animals in this work are meant to reference the transmutation of species, an evolutionary theory predating Charles Darwin's natural selection that supposed one species could transform into another. 18th century evolutionary theory did much to suggest that Caucasian men are quantifiably superior to others, with women, people of color, and the disabled being evolutionarily, evolutionally closest to animals. Rosie Bredotti, a feminist theorist, writes, Linnaeus, in his classification system of all living things, assumes a hierarchical relationship between the races, which was to become, a set, become central to the European worldview. Thus, in the 10th edition of his Systema Naturae in 1759, 
Linnaeus postulates a race called Homo monstrous, which is one of the branches of Homo sapiens living in remote regions of the earth. Against this backdrop, Hirschman Leeson's breathing machines act as mutant beings that breathe themselves into existence as a radical act. Tito Stiles' 2015 video, Factory of the Sun, updates cyborg theory to address more contemporary concerns, namely omnipresent surveillance and the dead economy. The video features protagonist Yulia, a video game designer, and her brother, the YouTube dance sensation TSC, or Take Some Crime, in a gamified half CGI world haunted by a high frequency trading algorithms. This is really not meant to make sense, this video. The title is a direct reference to a line in Haraway's Cyborg Manifesto, our best machines are made of sunshine, and so on. Factory of the Sun begins with Stiles' voice, repeating the mantra-like statement, our machines are made of pure sunlight, sunshine is our factory, all photos are created equal. The video cuts to Yulia, who is wearing a gold cat suit and says, hello, my name is Yulia. I am coding a game called Factory of the Sun, but you will not be able to play this game. It will play you. That's Yulia. The video focuses primarily on Yulia and TSC's biography growing up as orphans after their other family members are murdered at the Soviet-Chinese border as enemies of Stalinism. And this actually happened. This is actually real bio bio biographical information about the people that Stiles casts in her videos, which are oftentimes her students or assistants. And um, she focuses on their biographical information and kind of weaves it into a, um, a, a narrative and then a meta-narrative about the video and how she met them and so forth. From early childhood, Yulia and TSC are raised in an orphanage called Orphans of the Enemy, later moving to Israel and then Canada. And yet, true to Stiles' maverick video practice, Factory of the Sun positions Yulia and TSC's exceedingly specific background into a universally relatable story through the blending of various light motifs and filmmaking genres. Stiles weaves together interviews, science fiction fantasy game animation, and a meta documentary of the filmmaking process to create a nonlinear narrative about these two remarkable siblings who in adulthood now live in an environment marked by the debt economy. The real life high frequency liquidity seeking trader, trading algorithms Sniper made by Credit Suisse and Stealth Super X Plus made by Deutsche Bank are real and pop up in Stiles video game or video in a game environment as disembodied Stalin heads that attempt to shoot you. The ideas of death, death and transformation through trauma are major threads in Shiro's work and are usually portrayed as a joyful process. Haraway writes, by the late 20th century, our time, a mythic time, we are all chimeras, theorized and fabricated hybrids of machine and organism. In short, we are cyborgs. <laughs> For artists of a younger generation, born in the 1980s and 90s, the cyborg is a legendary cultural allegory pioneered by mid to, 20th, mid to late 20th century second wave feminists, not without its faults. Today, the historical contributions of these women artists are both lauded, but also seen as deeply flawed. Too much heed was paid to the white, cisgendered, conventionally attractive and able female body. We now understand the exclusive visibility 
of these normative bodies alienates others and even serves patriarchal ends. As pre-existing cultural image, the cyborg can be resuscitated by artists and other creative producers, but not with their own associations to include 20th century nostalgia. In a younger generation, we can detect a collective interest in bodies that are traditionally othered, the differently gendered, the non-white, the ugly, the fat, the needy, deformed, and monstrous bodies. Deformed bodies in particular provoke an unbridled curiosity in most people. Bredati writes that the fascination and disdain with which teratological deformities, meaning that those deformities that are formed in the womb, have been met with such an intense desire to understand their origin that it is tantamount to <coughs> epistemophilia. And I, I think this rings pretty true. If you ever you know, know someone who has a disability, I think that you know that they get a lot of questions about what happened to them. This epistemophilia, or love of knowing, arises from a historical and deep-seated mistrust in women's ability to procreate, as the mother is often blamed for prenatal deformities. Thus, the idea of the monstrous body is particularly tied to womanhood because the child's entire morphological destiny is played out during conception and the period of gestation. And above, this is the, an image of um, something related to homo monstrous, which I believe this is a drawing of the evolution of a African man, which is closely related to the scientist or ethnologist to a monkey. While the cyborg bears more recent and specific emancipatory cultural associations, in comparison, the monstrous body is a much older negative archetype that recurs in freak shows and film, particularly anime and science fiction, and one that has only recently been considered an empowering allegory. Andrea Crespo's series of videos, Parabiosis, focuses on communities that congregate on user-generated art websites, such as DeviantArt, to draw characters that are conjoined or have multiple appendages. DeviantArt largely hosts amateur anime drawings, a genre that is now fascinated with teratological and biological transformations, usually into something monstrous or abject. Crespo centers her attention on this community because it represents a seldom understood subjectivity. Many of the artists who create twinned or conjoined characters on deviant art are either physically disabled or have mental health disorders such as autism or disassociative personality disorder or simply feel disenfranchised. <coughs> Members' fascination sometimes goes beyond drawing and into a morbid obsession with the idea of becoming a conjoined twin or with fetishizing actual conjoined twins. Others develop a pornographic interest in amputees or those with teratological bodies. Some become so obsessed with achieving physical deformity that they might maim or blind themselves, a condition known as disintegrity disorder. For others, the fascination with deformed bodies has a more spiritual motivation separate from disintegrity disorder. <coughs> Crespo's video, Parabiosis, Neurolibidinal neuro Conduction Complex 2.2 from 2015, opens with a black background punctuated by lines of light. And as you can see on the screen, this is a still from that video with the scanner bar um, being pulled through the screen. 
A scanner bar slowly pulls across the screen as if marking one's entrance into a portal while an ambient soundtrack squeaks and drones. Paced by the hypnotic luminescent scanner bar, the monochromatic video bears both a clinical and science fiction feel. A puzzle piece breaks off from its set as the scanner bar again wipes the screen clear and starts anew, as if denoting a hypnotic, ritualistic entrance into deviant art. Graphs representing cellular processes and psychological disorders disappear and appear on screen, interspersed with tracings of manga drawings of conjoined tw twins, as well as a sparse script of words that appear on the screen. Wandering, mirroring, dissolving, breathing, encoding. You're never alone. You're a signal. The idea is, of being a signal is one that harkens again to Haraway's Cyborg Manifesto. In an understated narrative arc, the, the video subject, or perhaps multiple subjects, finds itself newly at home in its new segmented, segmented self, wandering, or splitting, forgetting, replicating, duplicating. You are a signal, never alone, always together. The work of both Crespo and Haraway contains a, contains a clear call for a sort of ethereal solidarity. For Haraway, the cyborg emancipates the body from its natural or, origins. It is a death knell to sex positive goddess feminism and suggests rather than a worshiping of traits traditionally considered female, like flowing hair or large hips or whatever, Instead, a total reconsideration of the body, its definitions and peripheries. For Crespo, the massive population that inhabits these online conjoinment communities proves that the pre-existing modes to express an alternative teratological subjectivity are today insufficient. Given that teratological bodies are still today the subject of such disdain, it took the internet to provide a niche meeting place for those who identify with inhabiting teratological bodies. Further, traditional film and cinema have historically chained the female and othered body to its limiting conventional representation, and as such, the internet has in distinction given back some control to the everyman's self-representation. While repressive scientific notions, such as eugenics and Linnaeus's homo monstrous, have become a thing of the past, their cultural and societal effects live on. Across decades and cultural and technological conditions, the artists that that were presented here highlight embodied differences as a political act in solidarity with other monstrous bodies, disabled bodies, non-sexual women's bodies, black bodies, transgender bodies, all of which are still marginalized by popular culture. Perhaps through writing them into to existence as a form of cultural exposure therapy, they will become not monstrous, but just bodies. Thank you. Are there uh, questions for Karen? Maybe not so much a question, but did you... Oh, you just came. You came right after the screening. Because for me, it was something that I was thinking about during the screening of the film, but also like in, in contrast to, to your talk. Like how much Belufa's um, work relies on us othering the actors. Hmm. 
Ah, okay. That it's an element that he either consciously or subconsciously utilizes, and that a certain artistic quality or worth or knowledge is being ascribed to this instrumentalization of, of like a racial differentiation. I think that he would probably be pretty familiar with that feeling though, because like from what I know about him, he's a, a person of color and probably like, you know, could consider that as a tool, this kind of like anticipation of othering. So I don't, I don't know if you had like a problem with it, but it could be something that's very much in his toolbox to think about this kind of like anticipation of, you know, a kind of racial prejudice. Someone else. Hi, Karen. Thanks for your talk. Um, I was wondering how you considered um, this within your body of work and how it might continue to grow as a text um, in relation to how you're using certain examples of work, uh, which is just a fragment of an artist's practice, to um, illustrate what you're talking about. Um, well, I, I wrote a text before this that was just published in the volume called Mass Effect that was edited by Lauren Cornell and Ed Halter. And that was more about how um, sex and gender have evolved as kind of cultural expressions online. And so it's just something that I'm writing a lot about right now, but um, I should probably try to curate a show about it and collaborate with some artists, but I haven't tried. <laughs> But also, if you guys have like clarifying questions, if you didn't understand anything, I'm happy to answer those kind of questions too. Um, I, I was wondering, Karen, how you, uh, because in uh, recent uh, discussions I had with artists or friends, what sometimes comes up is that um, the struggle you, you talked about at the beginning of your presentation um, uh, mainly you gave a lot of examples from the 60s and the 70s um, that a lot of uh, men are actually at this moment struggling with exactly the same things because they feel equally marginalized and forced into a system that is not uh, not theirs. They never chose uh, for it. It's they didn't make it, but at the same time it dictates their lives as well. So it seems to be that um, uh, we have come to a point where uh, both men and women are fighting the same fight. Uh, well, not all of us, but uh, some of us, and it seems that it, this isn't like the ultimate emancipation is from this sort of male, uh, traditional male um, values economic system that forces us into, uh, for example, high levels of productivity. And I was wondering if you, um, if it's something that uh, that I imagine, or that you have come across this as well? or Yeah, I mean, I think that there are a lot of male allies, like for sure, like I totally think that feminism is a pan-gender issue, one that, it, you know, is something that both um, men and women can be part of and should be part of. But I also do think that like, you know, racism and, you know, difference. I also think that like, you know, these are systemic issues that we have to be part of um, together to kind of challenge them. And so I don't think this is necessarily about finger pointing. 
as much as it is about consciousness raising and working together to think about um, how these things play out in like very minute interactions in daily life. Um, on the way over, I was just reading this article about how at a conference, this journalist um, was asked if he had any female journalists that inspired him throughout his life. And he said, no, you know, like that's just not what was happening like during the 60s and 70s. Like there just weren't any women around trying. Like they were kind of more comfortable doing their own fiction work. And, um, you know, responding to that in a very serious way, I think is just kind of part of how to be an ally together and to, you know, realize that of course these are the things that are still going on, you know, maybe slightly less in a cultural sphere, but also still very present. Um, yeah. Any other thoughts on this or other issues that came up during the day? This is sort of the last moment for questions because after the break we will have a performance and then uh, uh, and and well and that will be it. <laughs> so if there's questions about uh, for other speakers or presenters earlier today, that's fine as well. Yeah. Hey, Karen. How you doing? Yeah. Hey, Mo. How you doing? Um, so, hearing your paper um, made me think of some of these ideas that, like, I've, I've, like, I've thought about, and I'm sure other others have also thought about it, which uh, have to do with how, so, like, the, the both categories of, like, I mean, I mean, we, there are like difficult realities about the about race that we have to remember, which is sort of like. The first encounter with the, with, the, with the racial other, particularly with 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 the Af African man, and this kind of like brings the video into the into conversation as well. And, and the way and the way women were built into the European culture had a lot to do with the fact that, like both of these types of othernesses, were signs of a particular type of technologies or biotechnologies that these two traits of humans possessed. With, with African Americans, it was about labor and it was about being more bodily abled. And with women, had to do with like reproductive labor. And in fact, in fact, in fact, putting them down had a lot to do with like how they were in a way seen as superior or as a forms of technologies that the white man lacked, which needed to be brought into the system. But but how do you how do you how do you overcome these these superiorities? Of course, by projecting an in inferiority into it. So, and, and the, 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 these types of attitudes towards towards otherness are crucial to sort of like overcome those uh, inequalities. It, to look at to to look at what you have as a as a type of technology that is superior to to the person who's trying to tell you that you're not equal to me is actually very empowering. Even though even though it's in a way, it's kind of reductionist to, to say, oh, you can't just reduce the woman to the womb, or you can't reduce the, the African to the muscle. But, but that's how they were framed. That's how they were brought, brought and subjugated. So the, these offer another way of sort of like opening up the conversation and kind of like moving away. So rather than fighting for equality, is in a way saying like, no, actually, I'm better than you because I can reproduce as a woman, and you can't. <laughs> And you still need me if you want labor, and if you want cognitive labor, and if you want consumers. You still, I mean, I mean, isn't that the drive of techno? Isn't that the, the the white man's fascination with robot is to somehow be able to reproduce, like take away that and kind of do it without without the woman's body? That's really body? interesting, for sure. I mean, maybe this is the reason why fembots have been so popular throughout, you know, the last 50, 60 years. But I, I think it's interesting that you say that because. I, I've been doing a lot of thinking about how class is very closely related to um, a heightened sense of otherness and a heightened sense of prejudice. And, you know, in the South, where there is not as much wealth as in the North of the United States, you know, with this history of slavery as well, racism is very, very, very much more um, potent. And as well as in, for example, East Germany, where um, many more people are impoverished, where there's a lower um, percentage of 
working class people, there's often much more neo-Nazi activity. And it makes me realize that class and racism and otherness are kind of actually very romantic bedfellows. And I haven't really thought about it in terms of technology, how you put that, and I really like that, and I'm gonna turn that over in my mind, but it makes me think of this kind of close proximity between otherness and class. Thank you. There's a question up there, uh, Jeroen. Thanks for your your talk. Um, I just had a question about the the some of the things that you said about display, because you you mentioned or you you said that the the display of body differences as a political act, and I I really I wonder about this term, first of all, about display, because it implies already viewer and viewed. So how can it be that to display something, or even worse, someone, can be a, an, a, an empowering act? So maybe I think I might propose it has something more to do with visibility than, than display. Is that how you see it? Yeah, no, that's, that's a really good distinction. I totally agree with you. I mean, I think that there's been a lot of renewed discussion about second wave feminist art and how kind of flawed it is. And of course, a lot of second wave feminists right now are kind of really putting their feet in their mouths about a lot of different issues if you've been paying attention to the top feminist news. But um, basically, I think that we have realized that display, the display of the body is something that no matter what is always going to kind of be in constellation and under the purview of a male gaze. Um, and that's just how it is. But to say that like I am going to exist despite not wanting to be displayed by a popular culture or a popular sentiment, I think that's the radical act here. To kind of, you know, just be visible. So I think that like this distinction between display and visibility is, is definitely a very, very good one. 